Good morning, everybody. It's Jeff Goldberg for the Sales Pro Network. It is Friday, April 15th, and that means if you're here in America and you haven't paid your taxes, better get to it pretty quickly. Hey, Hi, nice morning, Jeff. Uh-oh. Uh, I'm a sales coach and trainer. I've worked with salespeople for 48 years now, and I help salespeople and the companies they work for get measurable and sustainable sales increases. And I founded the Sales Pro Network as a place where salespeople can come and hang out, network with each other, ask questions, get great coaching, and on every Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern, we do a, either a live interview with somebody who can add value to the profession of sales, or I do a live training. And today, we've got an expert in the world of sales and sales management. It's my pleasure to introduce you to my new friend, David Weiss. Good morning, David. Good morning, Jeff. How are you? I'm outstanding, my friend. How about yourself? Very well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. I'm really looking forward to this, David. Uh, could you maybe start out with giving us the two to three minute version of your background? What brought you up to this point? And then we'll get in some great questions. Yeah, I've been in uh, sales, sales leadership for about 15 years. Um, spent a lot of that in the like Fortune 250 space. Uh, ADP was uh, about half of that career. Um, left that to kind of pursue the the dream of becoming a head of sales of a startup. So uh, joined uh, the startup space um, with uh, outreach. Uh, then moved over to Seismic, uh, lead as a RVP with them. And then most recently, uh, kind of you know uh, hit that uh, hit that milestone that I was going for, and um, I'm now a head of sales for a uh, seed round startup called Lisa, trying to transform the property tech space. Um, and we're pushing for our Series A by the end of the year. So uh, super exciting. Um, on the uh, personal side of things, um, I'm a uh, New England guy living in Texas. Uh, so I live in Houston. Uh, I moved down here, I was tired of snow and shoveling snow and you know high cost of living. So uh, I live on the lake. My hobbies are, are boating and cooking. I've got an eight year old son who's home from school. So he may say hi, his name is Ian. And uh, yeah, man, that's me. Uh, and you also uh, help salespeople besides at your company, you, you have uh, programs and systems for salespeople. Let's start out with uh, what is the MedPIC framework? And that's M-E-D-D-P-I-C-C, MedPIC. What is that? Yeah, yeah, totally cool. So um, MedPIC started in the 90s as, as Medic, um, and then it moved to MedDIC, and now it's MedPIC. But it is essentially a, a gap analysis checklist. It is a way to sit on top of your deals and look at them. So um, I've been using that framework for about 10 years. Um, I was a pretty good, you know, uh, write it plan to, you know, slightly over plan, you know, sales performer. Um, I implemented MedPIC uh, literally when the, the year I implemented it, I did 180% of my number. Then, then they raised my number. I did 220% of my number. Then they promoted me and were like, you're making too much money. Go lead a team. Um, I took that team and they doubled their sales um, from the year previous um, and so on and so forth. And then kind of the rest is history. So um, I run a master class on it uh, at medpick.co, uh, and I've been teaching people that for God, you know, six, seven years now, hundreds of sellers. Um, I, I can go deeper into it, but the whole idea is you've got MedPick, you've got which is metrics, that's the business case, you have E, which is the economic buyer, the ultimate decision maker, you've got your first D, which is decision criteria, customer's wish list. You've got your second D, decision process. That's their process to make their decision, their buyer journey. Um, you've got the P, which is paper process. That's all the, the legal sort of things. You've got the I, which is identify pain. And you've got the two Cs. One of them is champions. Do you have them in your deal? And the other one is competition. Whole thought is those are the fundamental elements of every single sales opportunity you'll ever work. How do you then look at your deal? Say, are you red, yellow, or green? Red, I don't have the information. Yellow, I do. Green, I've got it all, and it's really lock solid. Um, that is when you know you can say, okay, I'm confident in my deal. So it's a way to look at it, break it down into those components, and then you know do a little gap analysis, blind spot check to see you know how you're doing on the deal. Wow. So I always say that sales is both art and science, and it sounds like you're helping salespeople to make this more of the science, which is I think we should all do. Yeah, I mean, look, um, uh, art is rarely repeatable. I, I think it's one of the right reasons it's art. Um, you know, then you've got science, which should be repeatable and scalable. I, I like to bridge both. Um, so I'm a big fan of the art and the science and bringing them together. But to me, that is like my underpinning of the science side. Yes, absolutely. Got it. And by the way, uh, if you're watching us live, please say good morning in the comments. If you have not connected your Facebook account to StreamYard, we won't know who you are. So if you haven't done that, please, if you say hello, uh, then put your name in there. If you have any questions for David, toss them in the comments also. I'll get them over to him. And if you're watching us on the replay, please put replay in the comments. Um, one of the topics I hear all the time, in fact, the thing that I find most salespeople struggle with the most is prospecting. Mm. And uh, when it comes to prospecting, you talk about tiering your accounts. What is tiering and how do salespeople use that? Yeah, no, great question. So um, 
early on in my career and when I worked with salespeople, um, I, I just attacked my whole book of business. Uh, cool. I just literally go down the list. Um, and you know, your, your bottom of the list and your top of the list, there's no, there's not necessarily any difference. In fact, your bottom of the list could be all your gold. Your top of the list could not be, and you could just spend all your time here. Like you just don't know. And when you're attacking your entire prospecting list, you're going to run into accounts that are smaller, that, you know, maybe not be perfect fit, but they, there's some degree of interest, but then they're going to suck up hours of your time every single week for months and months at a time. So, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to tell anybody, no, you want to be a nice guy. You want to kind of run the process with them, see what happens. But, you know, while you're doing that, you could be doing things that, you know, could lead to a, a higher degree of success. And, and frankly, you know, more revenue for both you company, more wins for your client, all those things. So, Tiering is the idea of how do I spend the most amount of time where I can get the best return for my investment. So the, the thought there is you've got either tier one, two, three, or ABC, however you want to do it, either a one or an A, whatever you want to do. Um, that's essentially like your top, and, and you could have 25 accounts, you could have a thousand accounts, so it kind of depends, but that's your top like 10% of your book. Um, those are your accounts that you are going to um, know better than they know themselves, read all their annual reports, lead, you know, read every new news article, do your deep homework on every member of their executive team, you know, map their stakeholders, high personalization, lots of calls, you know, handwritten notes, gifts, like th those are the ones that you are leaning in really, really hard on. Then you've got your Bs. Those are like the next 20 to 30% of your accounts. Those are the ones you're going to do some personalization, you know, some of what I just said, but you're going to kind of dial it down because that's a higher volume of that. And then you have your C accounts, which is essentially everything else. And in your C accounts, you're more throwing them into automated, you know, sequences using a sales loft or using an outreach or, you know, something like that. And you put them through a, a year long sequence where they get a touch every two to three weeks and you vary it between, you know, uh, your first one's normally personalized. You vary between like bump touches, adding value, different things like that, asking for meetings, and you just deploy it all that, that way. So you naturally are going to get the most amount of meetings with your A's or B's because that's where you're spending the most time. And then your C's are just going to find you and they may express interest. They may not, but you know, you're not putting in a lot of effort to get those meetings. You're putting in an effort where you're going to get the most bang for your buck. And that's the whole idea of how you tier and why. That's great. So how does somebody, how does a, a salesperson, especially perhaps an inexperienced salesperson uh, go about actually figuring out how is somebody an A, B, or C? How do you figure that out before you actually start prospecting to them? No, great question. So, you know, the, there's, you kind of want to look at like these matrix of factors. Um, some of the easiest ones, how big is the account? So how many employees do they have? Um, what industry are they in? Are they inside your ICP or not? Do you have like case studies or do you have competitors that are like them? Um, then you're going to, you know, do you, and this is a little bit more advanced based on research that so it just takes some time. Then you're going to like, do they have a problem you can solve? So like, have you re read in the news or their annual report or something like that, where they're saying they're trying to grow or do something or have some sort of initiative that they're publicly putting out there? Like that, that's an automatic, you know, great one. Um, relationship mapping. Like, do you, it has someone from a current customer of yours moved over to this new account? Um, does one of your executives or do you have a relationship to someone you know have a relationship? So you're kind of mapping it that way. So you're looking at these like combination of factors that are that that you are personal to you that you kind of look at and say, okay, based on these things, yeah, this one meets all of that criteria as, as a definitely A account B. And then, you know, you start going like, ah, oh, smaller account, not as many relationships, not in our ICP. Okay, that's more of a C. Yeah. So for an example would be for me, selling sales training, selling that to a company that has two salespeople is a waste of my time and a waste of their time. But a company that has a hundred or a thousand salespeople, that's much better. So for me, that would be an A. That, that's what we're talking about. Yes. I mean, or, or maybe it's a B and the A is the one where you know the head of sales. Yeah. Got it. Got it. You also, oh, by the way, uh, good morning, uh, Steve Kent. Good to see you, my friend, as always. Good morning, Michael North. Uh, he says it sounds like a great process. Uh, Mark Lawrence, good morning to you, sir. And Lisa Linker, excellent to see you. She says, good morning, Jeff Goldberg and David Weiss. Um, you mentioned the term bump touch. What is a bump touch? Hmm. So bump touch is that um, you send this, uh, they don't, it doesn't exist in marketing, which is why it works so well. <laughs> the, uh, it's, it's that touch in between the, the, your email. So, you know, your, your email is from like, Hey, uh, you know, love to talk to you about these things. And this is the impact we have. And we're great at this stuff. Can we set some time? 
or you're like, hey, I want to add some value to you. Here's an article that you can read, blah, blah, blah. Those are all what I what I consider more commercial. They're, they're marketing could have written it. What marketing never writes is, hey, did you get a chance to read what I what I sent you? Are you available Tuesday at two o'clock? That's a bump touch. A bump touch is simply let me let me bring back this the 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 thing I sent you, draw attention to it, but then quick one liner. Do you have any interest in this? Can we schedule some time? Love that. Yep. Uh, I, I find that uh, salespeople often waste a lot of time, uh, not only in prospecting, but also in the sales process itself, which is why I believe that an effective pipeline management system is so crucial. Mm-hmm. Uh, my, my belief is that the typical salesperson, which uh, is something we never want to be as far as I'm concerned, they treat every prospect that they're work, working on equal, and mm-hmm. they're just not. Uh, do you have some methodology that you, you can share with us for figuring out the pro- and I'm not talking about in the prospecting uh, mode. I'm talking about you're actually engaging with a prospect before they're trying to get them to become a client. H- how do you ascertain, here's one I should really put, be putting my time into, and here's one that I should invest less time into? Yeah. Do they have a problem I can solve? Um, when do they want to solve it? Um, do they have a, a active initiative, or is it just a single person exploring? Um, is there a, a team around it? How well does my solution align to that problem they're trying to solve? As an example, Jeff, like you, you'll have you'll you'll run into tons of deals, and, and this is to me where you, your more sophisticated sellers like really do some deep work and spend some real time with their customer, is, or, or a potential customer. Is they're like, hey, what do you want a solution? And the customers may say like, oh, we're we're just looking to do this. It's like, well, hold on a second. Like let let's peel the onion on that. Um, let's have more conversations around that. Let's build a scorecard. That says I that that says I really need these ten or fifteen pieces of functionality to be able to really solve this problem correctly. You're not selling on feature function, but feature function is what solves problems. Um, so you like you try to really understand the problem and the feature function to to accomplish that, and you get really well aligned on it because where where some salespeople will get happier is like oh they want to buy you know a, a CRM and we sell CRMs. It's like well you know there's there's a lot of like nuance into the CRM space. There's a reason why Salesforce owns you know 95% of the market, then HubSpot, then Microsoft, and then everybody else. Um, so they've figured something out there. So the thought is like do you really understand their buying criteria, and then do you really know how well you align to it? Because if they're looking for ten things and you sell five. Well, you're, you're misaligned and you either need to find a partner to close that gap. Or if, you know, you sell 10 things and they want five, they're a more immature buyer. And when you eventually get to cost every one of those 10 things when they need five, cost more than they're likely it's going to cost 2x than what they need, what a competitor may have. So you're misaligned with the criteria in which they're trying to buy and, and how you solve. And that's going to, you know, cause some sort of friction at some point in the process, either either price or, you know, um, or you not being able to fully meet the need. And if you don't really, really understand that, um, you're going to spend a lot of time on, on a solution that you probably can't win or can't win in the way you want. So, like, I, I look at a lot of those different factors between the, the people and the solution and all that and say, OK, how, how well aligned are we here? The, where, where we're more aligned is great, where we're not. You know, maybe be upfront about that and, and you know, work with them uh, at a later date or cut bait and run or, you know, what have you. Got it. I'd also throw in, uh, are they actually engaging with you? To, sure. to me, one of the most basic things, and I, I suggest the most important thing I share with salespeople is you never leave a meeting or a phone call without setting up the next meeting or phone call, what I call the best next action step philosophy. And, uh, you know, if, if somebody's engaging with me, if they're re- responding, if they're returning my emails and my phone calls, that's somebody I'm going to invest more time with than somebody who goes dark for two, three months at a time. Oh yeah. Yeah. And if they're going, you know, two, three dark, two, three months at a time, it's not real. It's not an active initiative. It's not, it's not a, it's not a real project Um, or there's misalignment and yeah, that that's you. It's often, you know, the root cause of some of that stuff. Yeah. But unfortunately salespeople in my experience, often they're chasing them over and over calling every day. Hey, I'm just calling to follow up. Hey, I'm just calling to follow up. You, You do that 17 times in a row. To me, what that really means is, hey, did you decide to do business with me but forget to let me know? Sure. Yeah, normally there's a degree of like misqualification there or not asking the right questions or getting happier is not digging deep enough. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of root causes to that. And I think a lot of our job is, as good sellers is to figure out what are those what are the, the root causes of things so we can then respond accordingly. Yeah, well, I think one of them is that most salespeople do not prospect enough. 
do not prospect consistently yeah. and do not prospect well. To me, that, that I suggest that that solves almost every sales challenge. That yeah. if you see enough prospects, you're going to close some. Now, that, that's not a recipe for huge success. But the first thing is you've got to be speak. Look, even with all your skill and experience and your methodology, you can't close enough business, and neither can I, unless we're speaking to enough prospects. Because I don't know about you, but for me, some people actually say no. In fact, more people say no than yes. Pipeline cures all problems. Yep. No doubt. Exactly right. And I know you also talk about uh, mental health in sales. And, uh, and that I think that's an important topic because we do, most of us, face massive rejection on an almost daily basis. So how can salespeople deal with that, especially newer people who may not be used to it? Yeah, rejection, burnout, um, toxic work environments, unfair situations, constant change, um, you know, counting on a big deal and losing it, not getting the promotion you want. You know, there's, there's a lot that goes into it. So my, um, my wife has her PhD in psychology. Um, she is a uh, mental health coach for salespeople and also runs her own private practice doing more, you know, actual, you know, coaching and therapy. Um, I have a degree in psychology. I've been surrounded um, by a psychologist my whole life, mostly because I'm crazy and they help me. Um, I like to tell people that uh, I married a psychologist to save money in the long run. Um, but, <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of it. And one of the main reasons I'm a big proponent of it is um, I've, I've gone through periods of, of what I call severe burnout, like where I'm, I'm a very high energy, um, love to work with people, love being around people. I consider myself a traditional extrovert. And I've, and I've had uh, really terrible, and I mean terrible, like abusive bosses throughout my life um, and, and other things like that where – they, I, no matter how hard I worked, it was never good enough. And no matter how, how high the, the number was, it was never good enough. And it would just cause this like need for hustle and, 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 and overwork and un, under like balance and burnout and all those things. And there were points where like three for like three, four months, I just didn't want to get out of bed. And I like didn't want to see anybody or talk to anybody and my performance, you know, dipped dramatically. So I, I've personally like gone through that struggle and I've learned, you know, now, like I, I, when I choose jobs, I choose jobs based on the boss. I can make money anywhere. Who do I want to make money for and with? Um, I make sure to, to take time. I make sure that I end my days on time at, at specific times. I balance my energy levels on my calendar. So I do some, I, I never do like 10 draining tasks in a row. I do, I try and like tap, I'll do one draining and then I'll do one that lifts me up. And I know my natural energy and rep, levels and rhythms and all those things. But all those things are so important because for the, for the basic fundamental thing is like you, and you were kind of just saying it with Python. It's like, I don't care how good you are. If you aren't with it, if your mental health isn't strong, you can't use your skills and your brilliance because you just can't connect those two dots because your, your head isn't in the game. And like that to me is why mental health is so important is we have to have that balance so we can actually, you know, perform at the levels we want to. Um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of mental health. Um, you know, if you've got some severe things, please seek therapy. If you got some kind of minor things, like you know, get some coaching. At the very least, just build some work life balance for yourself so you can kind of maintain the performance over long periods of time. Yeah, uh, it, it, while it's not always true, it's often true that top producers are hard chargers. They, they you know, we we go get it, and nothing's going to stop us, and we have a great attitude. But uh, I often uh, tell people, you know, I've never done anything except sales for in my 48 year career. But uh, the truth is, at one point, I did have that severe burnout. And I said, you know what? I'm done. I can't do it anymore. I, I can't take another day hoping that I'm going to make enough money, uh, you know, close a deal so I can pay my rent or whatever is going on. And I actually left the field of sales and, and took a job at Air Canada in reservations, went through. I, I said, the pressure's done. I, I just want to sit and talk to people on the phone and help them book flights. And you go through two weeks of training. I'm sitting down at the, the console the first day and in between calls, you can talk to the person next to you. So I said, um, how do you get a raise here? The guy said, oh, you'll get one automatically after three months. I said, oh, OK, how, how, how much? He goes, automatically, 25 cents an hour. And I said, well, what if I do a great job? He goes, 25 cents an hour. What if I do a crappy job? 25 cents an hour. Yeah. I raised my hand. The supervisor came over. I said, this job's not for me. I'm leaving and went right back to sales. But we, we all have that time where it's like, I can't take it another second. And I'm with you yet having somebody else to talk to, whether it's a coach like you or me, who they, they pay to talk to them or just somebody else in sales to get that out there because you can easily burn out. And if you're not at the top of your game, you know, I, I always say this, uh, uh, 
sales is not an easy gig. It beats digging ditches in the hot sun. And I don't know that because I've never dug ditches in the hot sun, but it's mentally exhausting. Uh, you mentioned, and I, I saw this in doing my research about you, that you have a degree in psychology. Besides, besides helping you to take care of that mental burnout and, of course, marrying someone who can do that for you, how does that degree in psychology or how does your background in psychology help you in sales? Oh, man. Um, I, don't, I don't use the degree, but there are definitely some, like, basic fundamentals of understanding human nature and, and empathy and, um, and things along those lines. Um, you know, they, it, it's opened me up a little bit to, to some very light, like, uh, neuro-linguistic programming around, like, uh, how do you ask a question uh, in, a, in a way that gets someone to, to give you a better response? But there, there's, um, we don't need to go into that, but there's, um, there, there's just things, like, fundamentally, um, sales is about solving problems for people psychology is about solving problems for people um you know psychology is about asking the right questions at the right times to get people to open up um knowing when to dig knowing, knowing when not to knowing you know just it, it it's a lot of that um so i think there's a a lot of overlap now what what i was taught in school is very different than what i use but there is some very basic principles of, of human psychology that apply to things we do every day sure. something as simple as how do you turn a stranger into a friend yeah. sure I actually suggest that sales is mostly psychology. And uh, I pay attention with my coaching clients to every single word they say, because I believe one word can be the difference between closing a deal or not, between making a friend or not, between finding out what you need to or not. And there's a lot of psychology in there. I, I see. And I haven't studied it like you have. I don't have a degree in it. But I say if you've got to understand how the human mind works in order to understand how to relate to prospects and help them choose to become your clients. Yeah. The best sellers are curious problem solvers. In my Absolutely mind. positively. I, I always say that, David. It, it, it's not about your brilliant presentation skills and it's not about your strong closing skills. Though Those are both lovely to have, but I've worked with lots and lots of salespeople over the years who are not brilliant at closing and not great presenters. But the best salespeople to me always have three characteristics every single time. First of all, they are the very best question askers. Like you said, they're curious. They, they, they tend to truly like people, or at least they act like they do, and they're, they're wound up to find things out. Like there's a, a TV show I love called How Things Are Made. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. Uh, you know, how do you make a tennis racket or how do you make frozen waffles? I love that stuff. So if you're wired up curious, I think you're going to be a better salesperson yep. by asking great questions. The second thing is, and most salespeople suck at this, you have to be a great listener. We, we forget that it's not about our great presentation. It's about listening to what the prospect tells us that they want, need, desire. And then, of course, I say you have to tell good stories. You have to be able to share a story about somebody else like your prospect who, by doing business with you, lived happily ever after. Yeah. Um, and, and then similar to psychology, when you're trying to help someone make a change, um, driving a degree of urgency. That's that's the one I would add. You can listen. You can hear. Um, you can learn. You can ask all the right questions. But then it, what, what a great seller does is they then connect the dots to, wow, here's your current state. I heard all of this. Here's your ideal future state. I heard all of that. Let's quantify now the value of the change um, and, get, and, and get them to move and understand that for every day that they, they don't solve that problem, these things are just going to get worse. And like that, to me, that's what great sellers do is they connect those dots to that value of the future state. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that, that that's that's a challenge, I think, for all of us in sales. How do we make the prospect be as how do we make the sale be as important to the prospect as it is to us? We want to get paid. We want to feed our families and we want to put uh, I forgot what you call it, the, your 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 golf thing in your house. You know, how do you afford to do all the things that you want to do? And you do that by solving other people's problems. Uh, but how do you create that urgency or how do you help the prospective buyer to to be in a state of urgency when it may not be urgent to them. Yeah, I, it's funny. Um, there's this concept to me of, of uh, daily lost revenue or daily impact. So there's there's 250 uh, business days in a year. Um, what I like to do is current state, future state, quantify the value of the change. So say um, uh, that your solution, you can agree with your customer is going to generate them you know, a uh, million dollars a year. Let's just use a nice, nice round number, a million dollars a year. So I would take that, you know, million dollars a year and divide that by 250. And, you know, for every day they don't make a decision, they're losing four grand. 
So, you know, hey, I'm happy to schedule a meeting in two weeks, but in those two weeks, let's just multiply that, you know, you just lost $56,000, so that's cool. Um, so, I mean, now, now you start getting that. Now, it's not always about revenue. There's, there's a lot of factors to it. It could be that, you know, they're this, you're, someone's working, you know, 60 hours a week, your solution could save 20 hours a week, and, you know, now they can get home to their family. So it's like, okay, so we can meet in two weeks, but if I solve this for you today, you can get home to your family tonight. Like, so it's, it's kind of just figuring out what's important to them and then boiling it down to something that's right in front of them. When you start doing these grand terms, you know, total cost of ownership over the course of three years, like no one's thinking three years out. No one cares about three. I mean, they do. But, you know, think about climate change. <laughs> like, you know, in 100 years, the world's going to explode. It's like, OK, well, no one cares about it. But if you can boil it down to like, you know, well, there's going to be a hurricane in your backyard because of that. It's like, OK, maybe I should you know, not drive as much. But um, the, the, the whole thought is like, how do you make it real in front of someone right now? And, and, and them to understand that for every day they don't do this, this is what could potentially happen you know, that day or the next day or the next day and the value of that. Um, that's when you can start creating some immediate just urgency. Yeah. And the only way you're going to find that out is by doing what most salespeople don't want to do, which is ask questions. Most people just want to tell their story. We, we love to present. And look, I'm a professional presenter. There's nothing I love better than a room full of people that have to listen to me talking to them about sales. But that's not how I sell. I, I, I always say salespeople don't get paid to speak. I get paid to speak, but not when I'm selling. When I'm selling, I get paid to ask questions and listen. And I, I think when salespeople get that basic concept, they automatically become better at their jobs. Um, what, what is, what do you call a blind spot and how does one recognize them in their deals? That goes back to MedPick without question. So, um, a, a blind spot is, um, na by, by nature of it, something you can't see, something you are not aware of. Um, and there, you know, my, my wife for me personally is my blind spot, like blind spot detector. Like I'll, I'll be in a, a human interaction with someone afterwards. Be like, did you realize you did that? But she's, she's HR. We were talking about that earlier. She's HR. She's like, did you realize that? So that's a blind spot. Um, so uh, MedPick is a framework to find your blind spots. It teaches you to ask all the fundamental questions of your deal and then see where you are, you know, totally weak, where you are, you know, somewhat weak and where you're good. And then it teaches you to know what to do about it. So you may think you've got a business case, but that business case may not be validated by the person that's ultimately doing business with you. It may be validated by, you know, someone, you know, lower on the totem pole. Well, you know what, if it's, if that's the case, it's a potential blind spot because when you go and present your final solution to the person that's ultimately going to sign it and they look at the business case that they've never seen before and never got a chance to validate and they blow it up in your meeting, it's like, okay, well, you just set your deal back. Um, where you maybe could have closed the deal right now if you had met with that person and just had a 15-minute conversation of, hey, here's the value that we see in this. Do you agree with that? Um, instead, they're like, no, you have to go back and talk to all these people or, you know, this isn't a priority or you're completely wrong. See ya. Um, we'll do it next year. Like, those things happen all the time. So, like, that's a blind spot where people think they're good because one person said they were good, but the person that really needed to say they're good weren't good. So, that, that's a, just an example of, of a blind spot. But the, the key with MedPick or any framework you want to use here is you need to look at your deal like objectively. You need to have a standardized measure to then look at it. You need to look at each of the components of it and you need to be able to, based on that objective measure, say, am I really good in this scenario or in this piece of my deal or am I not? Um, and then you know do something about it accordingly. Got it. Uh, when I'm doing research, whether for an interview like this or to speak with a prospect, I, I'm always fascinated by uh, various things. And yesterday I was looking at somebody's LinkedIn profile with a client of mine, a coaching client, because he wanted to sell to her and he couldn't figure out anything to interesting. I said, well, look at this. She's interested in war games. Uh, uh, I, I found that fascinating. What popped up into my mind was immediately the, the Matthew Broderick movie, War Games. I said, talk to her about that. There's something brilliant. And there was something that came up in yours, which I'm not sure what it is. And I'd love to know. What are solid battle cards? Okay, so um, one, ask her to play a game of chess uh, and call her Joshua. Um, but, <laughs> but, um, do you want to play a game? Um, so um, uh, battle cards. So battle cards are um, ways that you can keep track of your competitive differentiators uh, versus uh, your um, competition. So um, a battle card may be, for instance, like, Hey, uh, ABC competitor is really good on this and this. So, you know, don't mention anything around that, but where they're weak is on, you know, uh, this and this and people buy us for these reasons versus them. 
So that's the concept of a battle card. And if you haven't built battle cards for your top competitors, um, that's one of the things I teach people to do. And so when you're in a competitive situation and you're like, hey, you know, who, who else are you looking at? And like, oh, looking at these folks. I'm like, okay, cool. You know, um, and, and then I always ask this question is, are you okay? You know, it, it can be sometimes hard to see the difference between us and others. We all kind of sound alike after a while and you see 50 demos and like they still all start to blend together. It's like, can I, can I just call out a couple of the key nuances that align to the problems you're solving? Um, so you can kind of see why we're different. And people will almost always say, yeah, you know, that'd be fine. They're like, cool. Well, look, um, you're talking to this competitor. They are really good at this. Um, they are really good at this, this, and this. However, what I'd really suggest you do is dig into them with this and this. You're trying to solve these problems. They solve some of them, but where we solve this better is here and here, and we can do these over here. And I'd love you to, for you to ask these couple questions to them to, to really make sure. They may say they can do it, but ask them how. Like, really dig into that. That's called setting a landmine. So when they go ask them how, and they realize, oh, no, you don't solve it the way these guys solve it, and I really like this way, um, and you know that through deep discovery and asking the right questions and all that stuff, um, and in theory blows up in the competitor's face and, you know, the deal shifts in your favor. Um, you know, you have battle cards for your key ones, and you kind of, you know, bring those things to light. Um, you're not ever bashing your competition. You're using facts, and you're, you, and you're being an advisor, and you're pulling yourself back, and you know what? If, you, if the people they're talking to are really better, I'll tell them, look, I'd love to do business with you. Here's why you should do business with us. But if you're trying to solve these problems in this exact way, you, they do a really great job there. Um, and I'm honest about it. Um, so, you know, that that's battle cards. That's how you use them. That's why. Got it. Uh, if you've just joined us, you're either listening or viewing the Sales Pro Broadcast Network podcast and vlogcast. And we're talking to David Weiss, the head of sales at leaseup.co and the founder of the MedPick framework. Um, what, David, what is ch testing your champion about? What does that mean? <laughs> we have so, a lot of stuff that I was fascinated by. No, totally cool, man. I love this stuff. Um, so testing your champion. Um, we, and I guess, Jeff, how many times have you heard a seller say, I've got a great relationship with someone, they love me? Almost every day. Almost every day, right? And um, how often does it play out where like that person that loved them, you know, was just being nice? Almost. At least 50% of the time, probably way more. <laughs> right. So um, that's the idea of testing. When a champion is, per is someone selling for you when you're not there, and there's someone with likely access to power. They can be that person that says, oh, they love me. They're, I've got a great relationship. I met with them for seven minutes, and I'm their best friend. Like They, they I guess, could be that person. But the, the whole idea is um, how do you prove it? And you prove it by saying, hey, um, uh, can, before our next meeting, can I prep with you for this big meeting with all these people? Um, can you uh, – you know, help, help challenge my, my hypothesis. Can you help me, you know, speak the language of your business? Can you help me validate this business case? Can you get this business case that we just validated to an economic buyer so they can validate it with us? Uh, can you get me a meeting with this key person I'm trying to meet with? Hey, out of curiosity, this person says they can sign the deal, but are they really the right person? Or is there someone else that's going to, you know, get involved? Um, you're talking to all these competitors. Um, where do we stand? Where are they better? Where are we better? Well, where, where, where people not understand our solution. Um, you know, they're part of that decision committee. Uh, that's testing. You're asking those specific questions and they're willing to stick their neck out and give you those answers. They're willing to favor you above others and, and, you know, give you insider information. They're willing to go to bat for you. They're in your corner. That's champ. That's a real champion. And that's how you test them to determine that they are. Got it. Yeah. Uh, obviously that's crucial. Uh, my personal philosophy, and this is just for me, and I know this does not work in every industry, is I won't talk to anybody other than a decision maker. So I'm not looking for a champion. I only want to deal with decision makers. But I also know that in most, many, if not most uh, industries, you can't always get to the decision maker. And you do need that champion who's on your side who can eventually get you to the right place. So I love that testing your champion. Yeah. And look, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a believer like the uh, the modern sales environment has changed a little bit. Like, and, and um, I, I only, like, if someone's selling to me, yeah, they should probably only sell to me, but if they can, if, if they're trying to, you know, convince me to do something and they can get to my wife, this is more on the personal side, not the work side. Um, you know, and my wife's like, yeah, you should probably do that. I'm like, fuck, okay, fine. Um, so like <laughs> my wife would be the champion. Um, but the, the thought is in, in, you know, you have different levels of champions, small deals. Yeah. You may just deal with the decision maker or like one or one or two people. When you get to medium sized deals, yeah, there may be a decision maker and then like three or four people. But when you're getting into like enterprise level deals, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, ten, tens of thousands of employees, huge impact, there's going to be a committee and that committee is going to be six to 10 people. And having a couple people in your corner that are saying we should do this, 
that that's when that champion really comes in. So like um, to your point, like we want to be selling to a decision maker, but man, uh, the, I love this concept of surround castle. If you can surround that decision maker with people that influence them to make decisions, you're more likely to win. So it's, it's that thought. Yeah. The, the thing for me is I find that too often salespeople are not even trying to get to a decision maker first. Okay. Um, my experience is it's incredibly easy to get appointments with people who can't do you any good whatsoever. And it's much harder to get in front of people who can actually make decisions. Yeah. I say it's worth the effort, but again, my world is different than many. So, you know, in an enterprise sale, quite often you do have to deal with a bunch of people and that, having that champion is, is uh, crucial. Um, what's but the difference? Point, getting to the decision maker is key because if your competitor gets there and you don't, you lost. Absolutely. Positively. 100%. Yep. Uh, what's the difference between being purpose driven and pressure driven? Okay, so um, <laughs> uh, it's almost kind of like uh, the difference between in- intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Um, so uh, Daniel Pink wrote a great book called Drive, and he talks a lot about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation in that book. Um, so being purpose-driven is uh, I don't give a shit about the outside world. I'm doing this for me. And you know, I've gotten to a point in my career where I, I – um, I'm very lucky and I feel like I can be purpose driven. And that means I've quit organizations or quit bosses or made strategic changes in my life because I no longer align with those folks. And so my, I have my own internal purpose and, you know, my why is helping the sales community and having these conversations and doing, you know, things to, to help sellers be better sellers. Um, and I like doing that with people that are interesting and fun to work with and, and that I genuinely connect with and, and want to get out of bed and fight the good fight with them every day. Um, so I, I, that that's my purpose. And that's who I like to, you know, execute that purpose with. Um, so pressure driven is the exact opposite of that. Pressure driven is um, you haven't figured out your why but you're, you're fearful of losing your job. And, you know, it's, it's your boss, it's your quota, it's the number. And those are the things that motivate you. And those are the things that drive you. Per, the, the problem with that is um, what happens when you lose your job, miss your quota, or something goes wrong. All of a sudden who you are crumbles because who you've attached yourself to being is those artificial things that other people are putting on you. That's where lots of burnout comes from. That's that's where you know uh, self self fulfilling prophecies and, and downward spirals come from. But if you flip that narrative and you are purpose driven, screw everybody else. Doesn't matter what happens. I'm doing it for me. Um, so like that's that's the difference, and that's the value of the difference. Yes, uh, I say that's the I don't give a an f attitude. And, and look, I, I have a dog, and I I always post the pictures of him. I say he's the beach bug. He don't give an f. Uh, and, you know, in sales, you've got to have that thick skin and you do have to know your purpose. And so many sales, look, my experience is that most salespeople just never make a lot of money. Uh, it's good for me as a sales coach because that gives me lots of prospects and clients. But, you know, most salespeople don't know their why and they don't, they're not committed to being the best they can possibly be. Most salespeople don't go to a seminar, don't read a book, don't invest in themselves at all unless their company does it for them. And uh, you know, people are, all, oh, Jeff, you're a natural well, maybe I have some of the qualities that tend to make somebody better at sales, but I worked very, very hard in the beginning of my career to learn the art and science of selling. And I still read almost every book that comes out and I still listen to every expert because I don't know it all. And there's always something else out there that's, you know, we live in a world that's changing like this. You've got to be, if you're going to commit yourself to a career in sales, you might as well be committed to making a heck of a lot of money in it because that's, to me, that's the reason to go into sales. Yeah. I'm a college dropout. Uh, and knock on wood, I, I make a real nice living. And, you know, I, of course, I love working. I love people and I like and I enjoy the interaction. But at the end of the day, most people don't go to college to go into sales. We fall into it by accident, but we stick around because there is that opportunity. But not if you don't invest in yourself. You know, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's a really great point. So I, I've often said to people that um, sales is the profession with the lowest barrier of entry with the highest potential earnings. And if you want to be successful in our profession, you should treat yourself like an elite athlete does or any elite professional, which is to your point, 
they read the books, they practice, they get coaches and mentors, they watch their own game film, you know, they watch recordings of their calls. Um, they dissect what they do well and not. Um, and they're in a constant state of improvement. Like I, I love your bookshelf behind you because like the one on the far left is John Maxwell's 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. Um, and, you know, I, I know actually I can probably identify a lot of the books just by, <laughs> um, because we've read the same damn things. And it's like, you're only as good as the people and things you surround yourself with. Um, and if you choose to be great, like you can, you can make just tremendous earnings in this profession and, and have a really amazing, fulfilling life. Um, you know, or you can just go through the motions and, and not, I mean, the, frankly, the amount of time that you spend going through the motions is, is not that much more time than you spend being great at it. Um, if you're, if you are focused and, um, and do it right. So. Yeah, and exactly right. And I, you know, I didn't have to go through eight years of medical school or law school or anything else like that. I mean, it my really wife is. My wife I, did. I make twice as much as she does. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a, a top salesperson can often make more than a CEO and often, often CEOs come from a background in sales. What about, uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on AI. Uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah. You know, so many people are concerned that it's going to completely eliminate the need for salespeople in the future. I, I don't believe that. But uh, what are your thoughts on AI, AI and how can salespeople use it now? Um, oh man, I, I, I honestly don't have a, a ton of thoughts on this topic, except the fact that um, I, I dig the, the, the tools coming out um, that I, I don't necessarily call them artificial intelligence. Um, I, I'd call it maybe a little bit more along the machine learning side of things. Um, I, artificial intelligence to me feels like it, it, it requires humans uh, too much still and, and it, it breaks. Um, a lot of people have actually been um, sued for using AI in the interview process because guess where the AI learned its stuff? It learned from successful hires and guess where successful hires came from? The same damn people that are <laughs> like, that are uh, already being biased on the hire. So you just teach the AI to be biased. Um, so not so much an AI fan, but definitely um, uh, a machine learning fan. And like, there's some great companies out there that are, are starting to machine learning around like uh, open rates on emails. So it's like, okay, which subject line gets the best one? What, what length of email, what, what cadence and, and words and, and things like salespeople can absolutely use that. There's AI that, or, or machine learning around like um, helping people find prospects and serving those up at the right uh, time. There's machine learning that's going on around um, the, this concept of battle cards. So like if we're on a zoom call together and you ask me a question, I can have something pop up and say, Hey, you should probably say this, or here's the information this client's requesting. So there's some really cool sales tech evolution things that are coming out in ways you can use it. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you've got, if you've got other really neat things that I don't know about, you know, feel, feel free to share. I, I always like to learn. I just want to know what the, what the best subject line is. If, if I could just have the answer to that one, I'd be a happy camper. You know, it, it uh, much like sales, marketing seems to be mostly art, you know, throwing stuff against the wall, me testing and measuring, seeing what sticks and then trying again. Uh, you know, at, at various times, you, you've, been, you've been an individual contributor, a sales leader, a trainer, a coach. What, what part do you enjoy most and why? Um, there's a lot of overlap between, in my mind, good sales leadership um, and coaching. Um, I, am, I am no longer a salesperson. Um, I have made this jump multiple times in my career, I've gone from leadership to seller, seller to back to leadership, leadership back to seller. And I, in my, uh, it was a handful of years ago um, that I did that again. And what I realized is um, I honestly don't really care if I win anymore. Um, I care more if I help other people win. And, and to me, that was a really interesting, you know, shift from a, a purpose perspective. We go back to that. My purpose isn't, you know, me winning another trophy. Uh, my wall is literally stacked over there of them. Um, I've made enough money for myself. What I really, really enjoy is helping other people win and, and, and being su successful through their success. Um, but from a coach and a leader perspective, th they overlap a lot. Um, I consider myself, you know, a servant leader and, and a coach first um, in the sense that I'm always trying to help develop people, um, help them, you know, see blind spots, um, being there for them, um, listening to them. I often teach people that when you're in leadership, um, all those great things that you did to get into leadership. Most of the time it's you were promoted from being a great seller to a leader. All those great things that you did as a great seller, press the reset button. You're now a leader. And as a leader, take all those tools and things you learn for your clients, point them at your people, do great discovery with your people, understand them, serve them. You, they are your new client. And if you treat them that way, 
they will love you. They will stay with you. They'll run through walls for you. You'll really understand them. You'll truly help them just like you helped your clients. You're never the boss. Like you, you don't work, they don't work for you. You, you work for them. Um, and that's why I, I love leadership. So yeah, I'm, I'm a leader. I'm a coach first. Um, yeah. My favorite things to do. Yeah, I think you hit it on the head. Uh, my experience is that sales managers are typically salespeople who've been paid everything they can get paid. They've won every award and contest. So, you know, guess what we're going to do, David, we're going to give you a promotion. You're going to be a sales manager. And to, to the David in this example, it usually sounds like a good thing until you sit down at your manager desk the first day and you realize you don't know anything about managing salespeople and right. selling and managing are two incredibly different things. And it, it, I like the term you use servant leader. If you don't truly like to help others, sales management is a very bad place for you to be because it, it's an almost thankless job a lot of the time, unless you get great fulfillment from when people say, hey, David, you know, that thing that you told me to do the other day, I tried it, I closed the deal or I'm getting a promotion or I made some, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that as a coach that like, like me, I get those all the time, you know, and it, it makes me feel good. It, it makes me feel like all the pain in the ass stuff that goes with it is well worth it because salespeople, myself included, by the way, are mostly babies. You know, we, we, we give me the good leads. I don't want the bad leads. And when I blow a deal, I want you to put your arms around me and tell me it's going to be okay. And when I close one, let's shoot off fireworks. Forget about hitting quota, just every single one. So it, it takes a certain type of person who really enjoys coaching, mentoring, training, and, and watching and helping other people succeed. And that's not easy to do. It's, it's, it's not for everyone. And I, and look, I sucked at it. Um, I was terrible. Like when I, when I first got into leadership and I, I call it the sins of your father, um, most uh, leaders getting into leadership now are still being led by the leaders of the past. And the leaders of the past just screamed and yelled and held everybody accountable to numbers and frankly were jerks. Um, I like to consider myself more of a modern leader. And I think the leaders of my generation and future generations that are learned that the world has now changed and how you treat people should change. Um, and one of the things that taught me to be a great leader is that book I referenced on the far left there, the John Maxwell's 21 Hero Football Laws of Leadership, um, teaches you how to lead as a human. And, um, and I, I really, really love that. And when I learned that, thing, things changed for me. But I feel bad for the first part of the people I was leading. I, 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 was, I was still doing it old school and it was, didn't work well. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad you said that because I met with a pr prospective client just the other day who was talking about making a change in their organization, giving somebody else the sales management role. There's, there was a guy who's handling ops and sales management, all kinds of other things. And they, were, they, they realized brilliantly that this person is not giving the salespeople enough attention. So there was a young lady in the room who they were considering making the sales manager. And she made some comment. And one of the other people in the room said, Brilliant. Yeah, she'll just nail them to the wall and she'll beat them into submission. And I said, wait a minute. Uh, I've been doing this for 50 years almost. And yes, that is the way we used to manage salespeople. That's just not the way it is anymore. Nope. You've got to be the cheerleader and the empowering leader. And you've got to come from really wanting to help people succeed. It's not about beating them into submission. That probably never really worked. But you and I both know that's how it used to be. I've worked for screaming, hollering bosses. Yeah. Uh, it never motivated me. In fact, I'm the kind of person when you scream at me, I tend to retreat. I'm going to go away and I'm going to go, screw you. I don't need you. Yeah. I yell back at you and then get fired and go somewhere else. Um, so the, I, I think you're, you're spot on with that thought. And, um, and yeah, th things have changed. And, and by the way, if you look at the job market today, it is ripping hot. If you are a seller and you want a new job, you will get a new job and you'll get a 20%, 30% bump in pay. That. So you better treat your people right. Otherwise, they will get a new job immediately, making more money. Absolutely, positively. I, I, one of the things I offer my clients is outsourced sales management, where I actually take over the sales management on an outsourced part-time basis. And recruiting right now, it's nearly impossible to recruit good salespeople. It, it is truly a seller's market. Yeah. They can command huge amounts of money, great benefits. And uh, our, our friend uh, Don, Don Levine, who's a recruiter, is on this right now. He's, he's watching. It's hard to find great salespeople. And uh, uh, unless you have something good to offer them and being a screaming, hollering boss is probably not what they're looking for. No, farthest thing from it. <laughs> Absolutely. How about uh, uh, prospecting? Any any thoughts on best practices for prospecting today? You know, everybody has their own favorite method. Uh, I, I hear from lots and lots of people that, oh, cold calling is dead. You can't do that. Of course, I've always heard cold calling never worked. It won't work when the dinosaurs uh, come back. It, it won't work when black holes, holes follow the sun. But that's just one of many. Anything in particular that you're suggesting to your team? And, or is it a blended approach? Yeah, so um, the tiering is huge. We talked about that kind of early on. 
Um, so being able to tier your accounts and then ap apply the right prospecting mix to them. We, we were talking about AI and machine learning. If you're not using an, an outreach or a sales loft, um, I worked at outreach. I would highly recommend it. Um, that, that's my favorite. But if you're not using one of those tools, um, if you're not measuring, like, if you, let's go back to science a little bit. If you're not measuring success of, of your efforts, um, you're, you're missing something because you don't actually know what's working, what doesn't. Um, great sales leaders, like I, I know if I, if we put a certain amount of this level of activity at the top of the funnel, we're going to get, we're going to set this number of meetings. I know that I have the data to show it and it's repeatable and I can plug any seller into it. And if they just follow that playbook, they're going to get that result. That is, is, is modern prospecting. Um, a couple of just key things. Anybody who says the phones are dead are just scared of the phones and they need to learn to pick them up. Um, if you look at the data, and again, I worked at the number one company in the world with over a billion data points on how to set successful meetings. This is not my guess. I, I have the data. Um, I work there. Um, phones are the number one meeting setter. Um, now, it's not phones alone. It is a combination of emails, LinkedIn touches, and phones where your phone call that you're making is referencing and bumping the email that you sent the email is providing context to the call, and the call is what then sets the meeting. Number one meeting setting is right there. Second one, it takes eight to 12 touches to get a hold and set a meeting with anyone. So if you quit after three, you're just failing yourself. Third, bump touch. Your bump touch is your number one. We talked about that earlier as well. So pick up the phones. Don't stop until eight to 12 times. Use bump touches. Use data to, to fine tune the, the message, the, the subject line, the length, all of those things. Um, that is modern prospecting. Got it. Our member Don Levine says, as we move on in our lives and careers, everything we do should reflect our values and we should be paid for our knowledge. With you 100%. And uh, Peter Ekstrom, he says, this guy, David, is smoking. Peter is a big fan of cold calling. In fact, he wrote a book and teaches a program called The, the Gold Call. He, he's a master at it. So uh, he and I are agreeing with you a million percent. When people tell me that cold calling is dead or it never worked or it won't work, it just means you don't know how to do it. Okay. You weren't taught properly and you're afraid. Look, it, it goes back to that rejection thing. Yes, people are going to reject you on a cold call. So what? So what? Oh, Peter also says, uh, you seamless AI. I'm a fan of sales intel, but hey, you, you use what works. Got it. How about, um, here's the question I get all the time from, from, from uh, prospective clients. Jeff, can you come and teach my people how to close? Now, my thing is always, you, you want to... Uh, you want me to teach your people how to close? Great. That's a five-minute conversation. What your people really need to know is how to sell. But do you have a particular closing methodology that you like? Um, hey, this seems to make a lot of sense. Do you agree? I love that. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I, I was hoping you'd say something like that because mine is just a few words more. Mine right. is, you know, in my professional opinion, this is the plan that makes sense to me and what I believe we should do to move forward. What do you think? Right. Yeah. It, 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 it's it goes back to psychology there. I think there's a lot of psychology in those few words. Cause when I say to you, in my professional opinion, I'm coming out and telling you, you, you should listen to me. I'm a pro at this. And yeah. this makes sense. I believe we do everything we do because it makes sense to do those things, including buy stuff. So you're telling people this makes sense. Do it. The best, you know, the best players, they've done good discovery. They've aligned that discovery to the problem that they solve. They've aligned how they solve it um, to, to their solution. They've built a business case around it that justifies that spend. They've gotten to the people, the personal people that can make the decision. They've explained to them why it makes sense. They've gotten them to then agree to it. And at the end of it, it's like, cool. Well, something you'd like to do. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it's not, it's only hard if you haven't done it right. Every other step. Exactly right. And then of course, the most difficult thing for salespeople to do after they, if they come up with a question like that is to do the hardest thing, which is shut up. Just stop talking and wait. Power and silence. Yep. S salespeople don't understand. By the way, I, you know, you and I were chatting before, and I mentioned that you know I, I do stand-up comedy. It's the same thing they teach you when you, you take a class in that. Silence is your best friend. It's not always about talking. Sometimes it's about shutting up and just waiting. Yep. Perfect. David, I'm going to share my screen now. Can you please tell people how they can get in touch with you if they'd like to and if they're interested in the MedPick program? Yeah, yeah. So um, hit me up on LinkedIn, um, uh, David Bailey Weiss or David Weiss. Um, you know, it's right, right there at the bottom. Um, I work at a company called Elise Up. So yeah, hit me on LinkedIn. Best way to get a hold of me. Uh, 
in fact, Jeff even was kind enough to send me a couple emails before this and I a hundred percent missed him because I get too many damn emails, but he sent me a note on LinkedIn. And I was like, Oh yeah, Jeff, I'm here. So um, LinkedIn is without question the, the best way. Um, if you want to learn more about the MedPick framework that I talked about, M E D D P I C C dot co. Um, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm here to help people. Like I, my ethos in life and what I wake up every single day, Jeff, similar to you, is just help sellers be better sellers. So if I can be a resource for you or help you with anything, or you have a question after this, um, please just, just reach out. I'm, I'm here for you. Great. Yes. Well, thank goodness for LinkedIn. Cause I was panicking when I didn't hear back from you from my email going, is this guy going to show up? So uh, Sorry. And that just uh, goes to prove the point. You know, sometimes you've got to have multiple ways to get in touch with your prospects because you never know what's going to work. That's it. Jeff, thank you so much for having me. David, thank you. Really, thank you for your time and sharing your brilliance generously with us. Uh, any final words? Um, happy selling. Enjoy the week. <laughs> Thanks for listening. And uh, again, if I can help you, let me know. I'll agree with happy selling. Please, ha if, you, uh, if you're celebrating a holiday uh, in the next week or over this weekend, please have a great one. And I'll end this as I end everyone. Please remember that sales is a game of making things happen. So team, get out there and make sales happen. Thank you, David. Thank you, everybody. Have sure. a great weekend.